Okay, so let's begin. Uh, your last homework assignment is due on Thursday. And remember that uh, through the semester, you're only required to submit uh, 10 assignments. And in fact, if you submit more than that, that it'll just be the first 10 assignments that your grade is based on. So uh, that's due on Thursday. Now, that's not to say that I don't think you shouldn't do the assignment. If, uh, if you've already had your 10 graded, I think you should do all of the assignments and review the solutions that are posted online and become acquainted with uh, any place that you may have slipped up. It's just that uh, to try and reduce the workload on the grader a little bit, it's just 10 that are going to be included in your overall weighted average for uh, your homework grade. So do on Thursday that. The Thursday following uh, our last class meeting is going to be the final exam. Now that's going to be here in this room. The time will be from 10.15 to 12.15. I'm going to provide the same equation sheets that I've supplied uh, for the other two exams. And so you don't need to bring anything other than uh, your calculator and a writing instrument and probably a straight edge ruler because um, it's likely, if not certain, that you'll be asked to do drawings of energy grade line and hydraulic grade line on the final exam. Any questions related to the announcements? All right. Well, just to begin, let's take a look at a YouTube video that is related to the power equation, which we've talked about in a previous class meeting. All right, so uh, we're just looking at, let's see if we go to a good video, picture of it. All right. So obviously it's spinning, and then as it spins, it's uh, transferring that power to an electrical generator, and then the, the wires take it into somebody's house. So this is kind of an unusual application for hydropower, because usually the way that hydro hydropower is working is that you'll have some e elevated reservoir uh, that's discharging to a lower reservoir. And it, the reservoir may be a lake, it may be a, um, a human constructed reservoir, um, or it could be, like in the case of rivers, um, an elevated pool and there's a dam across the river that's discharging to a lower pool. But in this case, there isn't actually any elevation difference between the water on the upstream side and the water on the downstream side, but rather what it's doing is it's relying on the momentum of the water that's passing uh, through the generator to spin the vanes, which then start to spin the turbine. So it's kind of an unusual application, and um, it relies on fast-moving water, but it doesn't necessarily re rely on a lot of depth or some upstream head. So um, it's probably best for, you know, I, I don't know if you noticed, but uh, the website here is .ca, so that's Canada. And uh, so I, I think there are a lot of uh, people in Canada who live in remote locations that are maybe far from some of the main cities. And so maybe this would be a good application for a mountain cabin by a stream with fast moving water. Uh, but what would you expect are some of the weaknesses of an energy source like this? What are the drawbacks or the limitations? Okay. Yeah. So if you don't necessarily live near the stream, then you've got to get the power from the stream to your house. So that could be costy. What's that? A drought? Yeah. So uh, low flow would mean that you don't have, uh, you don't have power. Okay. Yeah. Government regulations. Um, in this case, I'm not so sure that there would be. There definitely are government regulations that come into place if you are impeding a floodplain. So, you know, uh, if you're pushing fill next to a stream and you're putting land where normally the water would flow during a flood, uh, there's regulations against that. And if you built a dam, there'd be regulations. But I, I get the feeling this is so small and innocuous that probably you could get away with putting it into place. and. 
Um, maybe fly under the radar. Under the radar. What was your question? What's the first time it floods? Is it just going to walk downstream, or what's going to have to support it? Okay. So great question. He says, what about when it floods? And so think about drought, which is low flow. That's going to be bad. If there's no water moving through the river, then that thing's not going to spin. Now, if there's really high flow, uh, it, it may get washed downstream. And during the video, we were, sh we were taking a look at uh, the people installing it had tethers on in case they fell. They had a lot of safety gear on. They had helmets and wetsuits and uh, life vests. <laughs> they really looked like they were going in there for battle. Uh, but I think that they also tether the, the generator itself. So if it got moved out of position, then assumably you'd have to move it back into position. You know, if, if the, it got washed so it was sideways to the river and not facing the river, then it's not going to spin any longer. But I think the greater risk during a flood isn't that it gets knocked out of position, but uh, think about um, when you have high flow rates, then there's enough velocity and enough scour energy present that it's going to be moving the bed load, as it's called. And so uh, the rocks and the boulders and the cobbles are going to be moving through there, and they're going to be banging into that thing and maybe even burying it. And this is a real problem that people face who study stream depths and stream flow. If you put an instrument into the river to measure how deep is the water, uh, sometimes you come back and it's gone. It's either washed downstream or it's completely buried with sediment or the bed is moved around a little bit. And so, you know, those sorts of considerations are definitely a risk. The rocks could move it, damage it as they uh, bang into the veins like that. But it would, it would be interesting to know on a real world basis how this thing's performing. And I don't know. This is just kind of a video that caught my attention one day as I was uploading my own lecture to YouTube. I'm always tempted to uh, waste a bunch of time, you know. I'm going into there to do the settings, and then I see all these interesting videos off to the side, and some days I end up wasting an hour looking at little hydraulics videos like this. And this happens to be one that I thought I'd share, but kind of an interesting application. Any other thoughts about this kind of uh, situation? Would it be more beneficial to have this almost like covering for the surface, hmm. tied in on the end, so that mm -hmm. we don't have to worry about the bed load? Yeah, what if it floated somehow, right? Yeah, if it, was, if it was tethered to float, then yeah, I guess it would be immune against uh, rocks moving along the bottom. But then if it's at the top, then think about uh, branches or floating debris that would get tangled in there. So I don't think there's any ideal solution. Maybe submerged partly. Uh, the other thought that I had is, this is Canada, right? What happens in Canada? It gets cold. So if that river freezes, then again, no power. And that's maybe when you need power the most is uh, on those cold days where you want to run the radiator and stay indoors and watch TV under an electric blanket, but now the river's frozen. And uh, these guys probably have a backup generator. You know, they probably have blankets, uh, so a fireplace. I mean, I don't know. Maybe it's just uh, you have like a cornucopia of energy sources, and when it works, great. You know, it's maybe a status symbol like a Tesla, right? Just kind of something that the, uh, the new rich enjoy to feel smug about how eco-friendly they are. The fish? Yeah, maybe they get chopped up, right? No, that's, that's not a joke because, um, you know, wind turbines, the ones that, there's some here in West Virginia, uh, up on, on the ridges, they chop up birds all the time. Uh, it's a serious thing, uh, you know, like uh, species loss, uh, from those wind turbines is real, so I would imagine that yeah, you could have sushi from this thing too, maybe <laughs> dinner and a movie. These people have to have lots of kids, so like when it's low flow, they say, all right, kids. Spin it by hand? <laughs> yeah, maybe. All right, so I hope you enjoyed that video. Let's uh, go over a couple of uh, hints or key ideas on these homework problems that you're either going to be turning in on uh, Thursday or just doing and checking the solutions without turning in. Uh, so here's a hydropower problem which is more the traditional hydropower where we're relying on head upstream of the generator rather than relying on the momentum of the stream to spin the, uh, the turbine. Okay, so from the sketch, <coughs> first of all we see we're working in traditional units and more about that in just a minute, but we have a head differential between the downstream reservoir and the upstream reservoir of 34 feet. OK? 
Okay, so that's going to be factoring into the delta z's here in the energy equation. Where would be a good spot to choose as location 1 versus location 2? Location 1 at the top of the upstream reservoir and location 2 at the bottom, or well not at the bottom, but at the surface of the downstream reservoir. And remember the reason why we like it at the interface of the air and the water is that then we can say what the pressure is and the fact that these are reservoirs with not fast moving water at the surface allows us to say that the velocity head at 1 and 2 is 0. And that's not to say that the velocity through the penstock is 0. That's just the velocity inside of the tank. Okay, so um, what you need to do in this is find the power that could be generated. First of all, let's say in a perfect world where there's no head losses through the penstock and where you've got a 100% efficient uh, generator and turbine. So essentially, you're going to be saying that head loss is zero. So you'll cancel out the head loss term. Now, there's no pump there, so you cancel out the pump term. And so what you're doing is you're looking at the delta z's and how much h sub t that provides. And so once you have the turbine head, that's when you substitute it into the power equation. And if it's perfectly efficient, then you just directly would use the power equation. Remind me to give you this pen later. I kept it over the weekend, and I couldn't uh, get it out of my mind. Felt guilty about that. All right, so what are the units of the power equation? When you're working in traditional units, uh, the Q is going to be cubic feet per second. The unit weight is going to be pounds force per cubic foot. And then the units of uh, turbine head is going to be feet. Okay, so we'll cancel out the units that are in both the numerator and the denominator. We've got cubic feet that cancels out in both. And so it's foot-pounds per second. Okay, and I give you this unit's conversion hint because they want, although they've given you the, uh, that H in terms of feet, they want to know the power in kilowatts. And so the conversion between foot-pounds and joules is given on the screen there. One foot-pound is 1.356 joules. And a joule per second, which is what you'll get when you convert these foot-pounds per second, you convert it from foot-pounds per second into joules per second, then that's a watt. Okay, so this problem is partly about uh, interacting with the energy equation and the power equation, but then it's also a little bit about units conversion. Okay, now the second bullet point is saying, uh, let's step away from the unrealistic assumption of no head loss and perfect efficiency. Let's allow ourselves 5.5 feet of estimated head loss through the penstock, and that's probably due to the combined effects of both pipe friction and whatever local losses we get from bends and entrances and exits. So we've got an overall head loss of 5.5 feet. So where does that go? That goes here on the right side of the equation, which means the, delta, the, the Z1 is where all the energy is coming from. You know, that's the only term on the left-hand side of the equation is how high is the water, 34 feet. So that's all of the water on the left-hand side of the equation. So on the right-hand side of the equation now, if you're adding in 5.5 feet as the head loss, that's going to reduce the amount of head that's available for the turbine to extract. So we begin the power equation with a lower uh, h sub t than we did in the first bullet point. It's going to be less power, partly because of the head losses, but then also because of the inefficiencies. The inefficiencies are cumulative. And uh, the formula that you should use in this case is that the, uh, the overall efficiency is going to be the efficiency factor of the uh, turbine multiplied by the efficiency factor of the generator. And so if the uh, turbine is 70% efficient or 0.7, you multiply that by the 90% efficiency of the generator, and then you're going to be able to find the overall efficiency factor. 
And do you multiply or divide in this case to find out how much power can be extracted, electrical power? How, you know, if we're going to be cook, uh, connecting this to our electric blanket and using that power, do you multiply the efficiency factor by the power equation or divide? Multiply, right? Because we're extracting energy from the situation, or we're, we're taking energy out, and this decimal is going to reduce the power that's available. So you divide by the efficiency factor in the case of a pump, because that will increase how much electricity you have to provide to the pump to get it to add energy to the water. But here, the efficiency factor reduces the amount of energy that can be extracted from the system and, and, uh, and used because of the losses, principally heat. Okay, any questions about this homework problem? Let's look at uh, another one. Okay, in this problem, two parts. First of all, some calculations, and then draw the EGL and HGL. And the good news is, as far as the EGL and HGL goes, you've already done this one. This is, uh, I think, exactly what we did on Thursday uh, of, of last week, where you've got a pump, so you know what happens with a pump, right? The straight line up. Okay, but let's look at part A here. Find the power supplied to the water by the pump. So the water's moving three feet per second. That flow rate is given. And both of these pipes have the same diameter. So the velocity through the pipes is going to be the same, both the pipe that's feeding the pump and the, the pipe that's coming out of the pump, the velocity is going to be the same in both cases. Now we're given a head loss equation that has some friction factor, 0.02. So you're not going to have to use that Moody diagram, Moody diagram quite yet. Uh, multiplied by the length of the pipe divided by the diameter. And here the diameter is the same for each of them, but you'll need to add the, the pipe lengths together to get the total length because there are head losses before the pump and after the pump. And so between 1 and 2, all of the pipe that the water flows through is going to cause an accumulation of energy loss due to pipe friction. All right, so we've got head losses. Let's look at the energy equation. So the left-hand side will be this 90 feet of elevation. The right-hand side is going to have the 140 feet of elevation, and it's going to have the losses, and then the pump is going to be on the left-hand side, and so you're going to have to find out how much power has to be added, what is the H sub P in order to get everything equal. I mean, there won't be enough energy on the left-hand side to be equal to the right-hand side unless you add a certain amount of pump head. So you're going to find out how much that is, and then once you have H sub P, apply it to the power equation. Now, go ahead. I'm glad you asked that. So let's say in a very likely case, you get a problem like this, but there's two different pipe sizes. Um, let's say this one's six inches and that one's eight. So you'd need to find the two different velocities and you'd break it up into the head loss through the first pipe and the head loss through the second pipe. So you'd, you'd still factor in both of the pipes, um, but then you'd combine them together. And so there'd be like H, law, H sub L1 and H sub L2. Uh, and then the overall head loss would be the sum of the head loss in the inflow pipe and the outflow pipe. I think actually the example that we're going to work in class today has a case where you need to consider two different velocities. So we'll get some practice with that. I, oh, maybe not. So the answer is you need to find both of the velocities, not just one. Other questions? OK, one more thing. See, this is bold. Find the power supplied to the water by the pump. 
So this isn't asking the electrical power that's supplied to the pump. This is asking how much pump, uh, excuse me, how much power is the pump giving to the water? So it's important to distinguish there's a couple of steps. The electricity is provided to the motor, and then the motor provides power to the pump, and then the pump provides power to the water. And uh, this is simply asking how much power is supplied to the water. And so we don't have to deal with any efficiency factors because it's just simply asking how much actually did the water get, not how much did the, uh, did the motor get, not how much did the pump get. It's how much did the water get from the pump. Okay, great. Um, one more, one more question. Uh, this one, you're given the flow rate, 16 cubic feet per second, and we've got two different lengths, uh, two different diameters, and they want to know the elevation in the left reservoir. So in other words, you know, what elevation is going to be required in order to achieve 16 cubic feet per second? You know, if, if we had more elevation, then there'd be enough energy in the left reservoir to put even more than 16 cubic feet per second. If the elevation was lower, then there wouldn't be enough elevation differential between 1 and 2 to drive the flow at 16 cubic feet per second. So we know everything except Z1 here. And they also are defining the head loss. Again, it's 0.02 as the friction factor, which is kind of a typical starting value. You know, I, I've told you before that we have to sometimes iterate and guess at our friction factor because we don't know what the F value is until we know the flow velocity, and sometimes we don't know the flow velocity until we know the F value. So one of our solutions is to begin with a guess of F and then converge on the actual value later on. So here, we're just starting with this typical F value of 0.02, and you're going to stay with that. You don't have to iterate the, iterate the F value in this uh, problem. But since there's two different pipes, you want to know the velocity through pipe 1, so V1 and V2, so that you can find the head loss through pipe 1, the head loss through pipe 2. But this is just H sub F. There is also local losses that have to be accounted for. And I'll remind you that this energy equation, H sub L, that is in the energy equation there, has two components. H sub L uh, consists of H sub F, which is the pipe friction, and H naught, which is the local losses. And so this H sub L is going to be H F one, which is the pipe friction losses through the first pipe. And there's also going to be H sub F2, which is the pipe friction losses through the second pipe. And then there are two local losses that you have to consider. Um, in this case, see how there's like a tapered inlet from the first tank to the pipe? Since it's a tapered inlet, we're going to assume that there's no energy loss from the tank into the pipe. But there is energy loss in the transition from a contracted small diameter pipe to a large diameter pipe. So there's going to be uh, H naught at location 1. And then the second local loss is going to be where we have the pipe discharging into the tank. And in this location, the K value is 1. And so, in other words, uh, you lose the energy, uh, you lose the velocity head as the water goes from pipe, one, pipe 2 into the tank. I presented previously the formula that allows you to calculate the, uh, the local losses at an expansion like this. Uh, you can either look up the K value from a table, uh, or you can just uh, use the difference in velocities. It's essentially the difference in velocities um, that tells you what the K value is, um, the difference in velocity heads. But in this one, 
you'll substitute in for location one and location two all of the known parameters. The pressure head is zero. The velocity head is zero. There's some unknown Z1. There's no pump. At two, there's no pressure head, no velocity head. The Z value is known. There's no uh, turbine. But then the head losses are going to be a function of velocity. So you're going to have to calculate those two different velocities substitute in the correct lengths, the correct diameters, in order to find out how much head loss due to pipe friction there is, and also account for the local loss. So a lot of accounting to do on this one in order to find out what the Z1 needs to be. Now I know it's obvious when I tell you how to do these problems, like right now you're thinking, oh, it makes sense, I don't need to do it. I get it. But uh, you need to practice it to be ready for the exam, otherwise you might not remember. But if you do it, you'll remember it. Okay? Any questions? All right, so here's the example we're going to work today before we do our uh, multiple choice activity. We have a, uh, a building on top of a hill. As we can all obviously see, it's a building on top of a hill. And uh, it's served by a uh, water pipeline that's experiencing both head losses due to pipe friction and also some local losses. And so the K values are given for these local losses upstream of the building. And uh, we want to first of all know this pump that's here, how much head is required to get a certain flow rate through the pipe. And so We've got the elevations. We've got the pipe length is known. The pipe diameter is given, so you'll be able to get the velocity through the pipe. And here's the H sub F formula for this one. So find the pump head, H sub P. And then once we account for efficiency, find the electrical power that's required. And then in part C, we're going to look at the water pressure at the top of the building. A typical water minimum pressure would be uh, 240 kilopascals. So uh, typical uh, minimum pressure, 240 kPa. So the question is, you know, what's the pressure at the top of this building? And is someone in the penthouse suite, which is the most expensive uh, real estate in that building, are they going to have enough water pressure to have a nice shower in the morning? Or do we need to put in another pump someplace? All right, so I'm going to pause this, give you some time to get a head start. I'll circulate, circulate around with the solution to check on your work as you're uh, going through it, and then we'll bring the solution up on the screen. Okay, for just a moment, let's pause and take a look at the solution to part A, and then I'll uh, pause the recording again and let you continue working. I just want to make sure we're all on the same page for uh, this first part of the example. Um, all right. Okay, so here's the sketch. And uh, we know that if the water's going uh, two kilometers through a diameter of 0.5 meters, then here's the energy equation. I've canceled out the pressure head at location one, the velocity head at location one, the pressure head at location two, uh, and the, uh, the velocity head is still going at location two. And by the way, location two is going to be the uh, outlet where it's got that jet of water. That, that blue line is meant to indicate that for whatever reason, at the end of this a pipe network, they're just shooting the water into space. Uh, so we've got an, an open um, orifice there that's discharging the water, and so we're able to say that the pressure is zero, but it still has velocity head. So I didn't cancel out the uh, velocity head term at two. Okay, so if we want to find the, uh, the head loss due to pipe friction, we have to put in the full 2,000 meters if we're going from one, which is the reservoir, to two, which is the outlet. Now later on, your location two is going to be the building. 
But before we can do that, we have to work to this outlet to find out the amount of uh, pump head that's being added. So that's why we work between the reservoir and the discharge uh, at, at a jet in part A. Okay, so we can find the, uh, the head loss due to the pipe friction is 33.80 meters. Now, your value may be different than that if you, depending on uh, you know, what you calculated your area to be. Although it tells us 500 millimeter, I'm being a little optimistic here in the number of digits I include in the cross-sectional area, so then I end up with 2.954 meters per second. And now we're squaring the velocity term. So um, if you rounded that to, uh, to 2.9 and then square it, that's going to be a lot less head loss due to pipe friction than if you have 2.954 and square it. So squaring it kind of amplifies any differences that there might be. In any case, so we've got the head losses due to pipe friction, and then the head losses due to the local losses, what you need to do is add up all of the K values. They're all, the water at each of these K locations is going the same velocity. So we don't have to find the head losses due to the, the local losses individually. You don't have to find you know, the head loss here and the head loss there and the head loss there. You just add up all of the Ks and then multiply it by the velocity head that each of them is experiencing. So 1.8 is the sum of the Ks. And then I multiply that by the velocity head and get uh, 8 tenths of a meter of local losses. And so then the pump head that's required is going to be about 50.44 meters with some plus and minus to that, depending on what round off you did. So that's just using one as the reservoir and two as the, uh, the end of the pipe where the water comes out as a jet. Any questions on that first part? Okay, I'm going to pause again and let you continue working because we still need to find out the electrical power requirements and then at the top of this building, what's the uh, pressure situation and how does it compare to our understanding that 240 kilopascals maybe is at the lower end of a standard uh, municipal pipe network? All right, let's take a look at the uh, solutions to part B and C, just to make sure that you're headed in the right direction here. So we already found out in part A uh, how much pump head is going to be added. Now, that pump head doesn't change just because we're looking at a different point in the network. I mean, the system is still doing what the system is doing, regardless of whether we're looking at the end of the pipe or if we're looking at some location in between. So it continues to add this 50.44 meters of pump head in part B and in part C. In part B is just where you're finding out how much electrical power is consumed. And remember that since this is a, uh, a pump, it's going to be using more electrical power than it puts into the water because of the losses. It's not using less energy than it gives away. And that would be amazing, but it's impossible. It's using more energy than it actually transfers into the water. And so what that means as far as this decimal of 0.58 goes is we need to divide the power equation by 0.58 and then that will give us a larger power consumed by the uh, by the pump and motor than is transferred into the water. So about 495 kilowatts is how much power it's going to be consuming. Alright, so now uh, the water pressure at the top of the building we're going to let one be the beginning of the tank, two be the top of the building, where uh, I mentioned previously that there is this uh, pipe within the building that's going up from the main line pipeline up to the top floor, and then there's a faucet at the end of that pipe. And someone brought up the question of, well, won't there also be a lot of bends and valves inside the building? And that's absolutely true. So once you open the faucet, the pressure drops because you're having velocity going around all of those bends. And the, uh, the water is flowing through the pipes inside of the building, so there's also going to be pipe friction losses. 
And so you maybe have noticed that when you're at a, uh, the gym or the airport and you're taking a drink of water and then the person next to you starts taking a drink of water, then the stream gets lower. And that's because when they start taking some of the water, then there's going to be more losses inside of the, uh, the pipes that feed the machine. And so then uh, the pressure available for your side decreases. So in other words, the point is, is that the pressure we calculate at the top of the building is kind of like a static pressure inside of the building. And it'll be even less than that once people start opening up the faucets and showering and so on. OK, so I just wanted to mention that when we're considering where is location 1 and where is location 2 for part C of this problem. OK, we have to calculate a new pipe friction because the length is just the 1,100 meters. It's not all the way through the entire pipeline. And that's a really common mistake. Uh, when I've given problems similar to this on the final exam, people have uh, failed to recognize that it's only the pipe that's upstream of your location that you're going to want to include in calculating the head losses. It's not the pipes downstream that are going to be contributing to losses between 1 and 2. But the local losses are the same as before because all of those local losses were uh, prior to the building. So when you rearrange the uh, energy equation to solve for the pressure at 2, you'll notice that I'm not including a velocity head at 2 because we said that the water isn't moving through the pipe up to that top apartment. Uh, so we do all the calculations. It should be about 56 kilopascals. That's too low. Um, in fact, during um, really extreme events, uh, a lot of municipal regulations say that the water pressure shouldn't go below 140 kilopascals. Now, 240 would be kind of just like under normal circumstances, but if there's a fire somewhere in the municipality or, uh, you know, like if it's the hottest day of the year and there's a lot of water being used, then maybe it could dip temporarily down to 140. But the reason why they don't want it to go much lower than that is then be it becomes easy for backflow to occur. And that's very dangerous. Uh, think about at the top of the building, if, uh, if the water pressure is this low under static conditions, when people start using water elsewhere in the building, actually you could open the faucet in the top, in higher floors, and rather than water coming out, it could start sucking. And so let's say that you have you know, your sprayer that you wash dishes off with. If it's down in uh, a sink full of dirty water, and then suddenly it begins sucking water into the pipe network rather than feeding water out, then you can contaminate the, uh, the water inside the pipe network. So these minimum pressure regulations aren't simply about, I like a nice steady stream when I shower. Um, the, it actually has some health and safety consequences as well, preserving the water quality of a pipe network so that there isn't infiltration and, and backflow of contamination into the pipes. OK, so that's the example. I also got the question of, uh, you know, how closely could you take this example as an indication of the level of difficulty that you might see on the exam? And you know, this is very indicative of the level of difficulty you could see on the exam. And so you know, if you feel comfortable with this, then that's great. Um, it doesn't mean don't study anymore. It just means that I'm glad that you know how to do this problem. If you don't know how to do this problem or uh, you got thrown off by things, then uh, some additional reinforcing practice would probably be uh, a great option. Any questions? No. Well, I'd hoped that we were going to do that multiple choice activity thing that I described, but it's 12.09, and I don't want to keep you late. So I think we're going to finish here for today. When we get together in class on Thursday, we're going to begin working on Chapter 8. So if you're scanning through the course material uh, prior to our lectures, Review dimensional analysis in chapter 8, and then I'll see you in class on Thursday.